Hi everyone, you remember where we left off? With the ultimate question that any president could ask his generals, how do you win a nuclear war? I don't know if you've been thinking about it, I hope you have. We're going to get to that question in just a second, but uh, let's talk a little nuts and bolts if you don't mind. Those of you who are my current students, you can follow along in this PowerPoint. It's been uploaded for you on the server. And um, remember again, this is just for your entertainment, just for your knowledge. But do keep in mind, before you completely and totally decide not to take any notes at all, I certainly could imagine that when you go off to college, that even though the AP exams have said you don't need to know anything past World War II because of what's going on right now, that your professors might expect you to know it. So you might want to take some notes completely up here, or just hold on to this YouTube link and watch it if you ever need it again, okay? And then last but not least, as so many of you know, I try to dress up as much as possible for whatever theme we're going through today. And I'm going to go over a lot of what I'm learning kind of on the way, but I do want to point out, A, notice the military uniform, but we're not at war. Yes, we are. It's the Cold War. Well, one of the things we'll talk about later on, a very, 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 very important idea, is that, as you all know, the Army did not go home after World War II, that everybody, including Elvis Presley, even ended up joining the Army. So, we'll talk about that later on. The cowboy hat. What the heck is a cowboy hat doing in, the, in a Cold War lecture? Your timing is way off. Well, because one of the things we'll also be talking about is how we almost had a cowboy mentality during this time period. In fact, the cowboy shows, as we'll see later on, became very popular at this time. But basically, you know, we were the guys in the white hats. Sorry, this isn't white came over just in the nick of time in the communists, the red hats. They were the bad guys. It was us versus them. So there was kind of this cowboy mentality, if you don't mind, during this whole time period. And the t-shirt, well, we'll get to that in just a minute or two. Before we can answer this question, how do you win a nuclear war, we've got to go back just a little bit to understand the mentality of the United States of America at this time. Let's go back to our enemy, if you don't mind. The enemy, of course, is the communist Joseph Stalin. We may remember the very last story we heard about is how David Greenglass turned in his own sister, sent her to the electric chair to save his own sister's life. Sorry, his wife's life. Got a little backwards on that one. And that the reason he did this was because he had given the secret of the atomic weapon to the Soviets. Which, of course, helps us understand from earlier why Stalin did not ever agree with Baruch's plan about sharing nuclear technology. How, in many ways, you could see that the Rosenbergs, or at least the Rosenberg, helped cause this entire, entire arms race because Stalin already had it in his bag. So let's talk about Stalin very, very, very quickly. We may remember that Stalin has formed the Warsaw Pact. And that's not really much of a pact. Stalin says, jump, they say, oh, I come that. In fact, let's talk about the t-shirt now. You may remember at Yalta that Stalin promised free elections, and they had free elections. Let's go ahead and give this a read. It's kind of hard for me to read it upside down, but hopefully you can. The people who cast the votes decide nothing. The people who count the votes decide everything. How ironic is it that right after World War II, with Soviet soldiers manning the polling stations, that all of these countries just happened to vote communist? Gee, that's a surprise. So, we have to understand who our enemy is. This is a man who fixes elections. Please keep this in mind, by the way, my future leaders of America, that this is still a threat here, even in America today. You may remember the election of 1876 and who counted the votes at that time, so this is not limited to bad guy Joseph Stalin. So, this is our enemy. 
they all do exactly what Stalin says. And we may remember that it got even worse when Mao Zedong won his war with Chiang Kai-shek and that the two new friends, Stalin and Mao, walked arm in arm out of the UN together to protest the United States' inability to recognize Mao as the leader of China. Things were looking really, 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 really bad, the protests. And then, in 49, how the Soviets had all of a sudden announced to the world that they had an atomic bomb, that the United States of America set up the Committee of Un-American Activities to investigate communists. Richard Nixon, oh yeah, you'll hear about him, this is when he first really became a national name, is put in charge of the Committee of Un-American Activities. And I ask you, my fellow Americans, what's un-American? Not liking Bugs Bunny, apple pie, going out during this coronavirus? What's un-American? Scariest time to live in America. You may notice the books on the sides. We'll be talking about those along the way as we go. These are all books from my college career, Joe McCarthy and the Press, The Strategies of Containment, about how they decided the containment policy. We'll talk later on about the fate of the Earth and nuclear war. And very importantly, 13 days, the entire movie. So these are many books, by the way, I would highly, highly, highly recommend, if not movies based on these books. But meanwhile, speaking of movies, let's talk about Ronald Reagan. This is when Ronald Reagan first ventured into politics. He, of course, was an actor. Not a great actor, not a horrible actor. You know, in his own, in his own admission, B-level movies, you're not going to see um, Ronald Reagan playing along with some of the greats like Gene Kelly and others, but uh, Barbara Stanwyck he was with, so he did make some movies. And in fact, he used that talent later on as president, being able to know how to communicate. His nickname was the Great Communicator. But what did Ronald Reagan do during this time period? He, committed, he turned in his fellow actors and actresses because everybody was terrified that they're communists under every rock and tree. J. Edgar Hoover, the director of the FBI, you'll notice the years 1935 to 1972. An incredibly fascinating, scary man. I don't know how many of you can actually read this, but uh, besides going after communists, he went after civil rights leaders. He actually uh, followed Martin Luther King on a regular basis. Martin Luther King was accused many times of being a communist by not just J. Edgar Hoover, even presidents, even presidents like Harry Truman was afraid of J. Edgar Hoover. He in fact said, we want no Gestapo or secret police and the FBI was trending in that direction. So J. Edgar Hoover, a fascinating, fascinating, powerful man, everybody, even the President of the United States, was afraid. That's what's so scary about this whole McCarthy era. The idea of the witch hunt, the two are synonymous. It's like the Salem witch trials on a national scale with modern day media. Let me show you what I mean. Take a look at a Senate committee talking with McCarthy about a list that he had just released of communist insurgents in our own government. Okay. One of the things you should have noticed just from this short clip about Senator Joseph McCarthy is he never actually gives any names. He never actually answers any questions. Any time that he is asked a question about a particular government official who is a communist, he ups the ante every single time. 
Over and over and over again, Joseph McCarthy would claim publicly on television that he had names of communists in our government, and this went on for a long time. Everyone was terrified of being labeled a communist. It wasn't until, thank goodness, Joseph McCarthy made the mistake of accusing none other than General Marshall, yeah, you know, Marshall Plan Marshall, of being a communist. And everyone began to realize he had gone too far, and thank gosh, he was eventually put out in disgrace, but not before the damage had been done. The McCarthy government was so, so terrifying. But even with McCarthy gone, it didn't matter. America was an America living in fear. It was, you're with us or you're against us. You believed in America or you didn't. Or as recently deceased General Patton said, better to fight for something than live for nothing. So the accusations went on. Again, Ronald Reagan is only one of the actors and actresses involved in all of this. It was a truly red scare in Hollywood, as people like Charlie Chaplin, Orson Welles, Burgess Meredith, who would play the Penguin in the original Batman television show and in the Rocky movies, for example, as Rocky's trainer, they will all be blacklisted, accused of being leftist sympathizers or communists, and Charlie Chaplin himself would even have to leave America, never to return, being accused of being a communist. You either were with us or you were against We were terrified. We were absolutely terrified. And it wasn't just because of the atomic bomb. It was also because there was yet another war going on. A limited war. Don't tell that to Korean War vets. But a really strange, strange war. It starts on June 25th, 1950, when the North Korean army crosses into South Korea, taking everyone by surprise, quickly pushing the entire South Korean army almost to the edge of the peninsula. And remember that originally you, my students, were supposed to play this as a game to be the President of the United States and try to decide what to do. What would you have done about Korea? We would have given you all these various options. Would you have started a nuclear war right then and there? Believe it or not, some students did. Would you start a limited war? Would you make threats? Would you care? I'd like to remind you that when George S. Kennan wrote the whole containment idea, that Korea was not was not involved in this. Korea originally was supposed to be inside the container. We weren't supposed to care that much about Korea. But something strange was going on in 1950. I wonder if you've picked up on it yet. And when I asked you what would you do, would you have realized what you could have done? Something that makes the Korean War an extremely different war, a unique war in all of world history. You'll notice the UN flag. You see, if you've really been paying attention, as some of my students in the past have, and very many have not noticed this, go back, go way back, do you remember when? Yeah, that's right. Stalin and Mao protested the UN and how they were not involved in the Security Council. What did this mean? This meant that, oh my gosh, Harry Truman and his advisors realized, oh my gosh, they are not there to veto. So what that means is it doesn't matter what your container looked like because when you drew that container, you assumed that the Soviets would veto everything. So you might have drawn it like this. But now, now that you can use the United Nations itself, well, now you can have a world army. You see, that's what makes the Korean War so unique in the 20th century, maybe in all of history. It was truly the very first fully formed UN World Army. Now, I know the UN has been used militarily many, many times in history, but never, ever at this level, and certainly never in a major global war like the Korean War would end up being. We would put the hero of World War II, the man who returned to the Philippines, General Douglas MacArthur, in charge. 
Why do we get to be in charge? Because there's more Americans fighting in the Korean War than any other country. And that's one of the reasons why a lot of people think the Korean War was a United States war. But it wasn't. There were 15 different nations fighting against the North Koreans. But even so, the Korean War was in no way, in no way, going to be a cakewalk. You would think, first of all, that the United Nations, 15 countries, and one of them being the United States of America, allied against just North Korea, that this should be easy. Well, first of all, I want to remind you that before the UN even got involved, the North Koreans had almost pushed the South Koreans almost into the water. And the only battle that everybody's heard of with the Korean War, there were plenty of battles, don't get me wrong, I'll tell you why you don't know them in just a minute, but the only battle that everybody remembers is the battle of Incheon. You see, because MacArthur had a daring, daring plan, a lot of people thought he was nuts for even trying it, and that was an amphibious invasion, taking the North Koreans by surprise, landing me way, way, way behind enemy lines, and this caused the North Koreans to retreat, not just to North Korea, but all the way towards the border of China. MacArthur and his excitement in his feelings that we were going to win this thing, victory, chased the North Koreans all the way to the Yalu River, the border of China. It looked like we were going to win this thing until shortly after that, 300,000 Chinese troops crossed the border, and now it's a UN war against not just North Korea, but against China. A China that's just come out of a civil war, that is armed to the teeth, that is ready to go. And they push MacArthur's forces all the way back into South Korea and deeper. Unfortunately, at this point, the Korean War becomes what we call the Battle of Attrition. The battles that you've never heard of, like the Battle of Hill 357, don't have big, wonderful, no, sorry, not wonderful, big, well-known names. Not like Battle of the Bulge or D-Day or anything like that. They're battles for small pieces of, of ground. It reminds me of, of World War I in a lot of different ways. And so, unfortunately, let me show you right now the entire history of the Korean I wish I could teach you more about the Korean War. You should have a whole class on it. You could take a whole class on it in college. But for our purposes, Here's the Korean War in a nutshell. You ready? North Koreans cross the 38th parallel. <laughs> Almost push them out. MacArthur lands at Incheon. <laughs> Chinese cross the Yellow River. <laughs> MacArthur pushes them back. <laughs> and back. <laughs> For the next two and a half years, very, very, very little movement over that parallel, over that border, back and forth and back and forth and back and forth, and thousands of men will die. It becomes an almost useless war. It starts to become an unpopular war. It never gets to the level of Vietnam, of course. And don't let me mistake, make the mistake of the going to career as anything like Vietnam. It's not in so many ways, not the least of which is because of the involvement of the UN. And then I would have asked you, what are you going to do now? Are you going to fight China? Are you going to fight China? China! I have had students decide to fight China in this game, and wow, boy, was that a mistake. MacArthur thought he should fight China. MacArthur even thought we should use nukes against China. Can you imagine that, using nukes against China after Nanking, after everything the Japanese did in World War II? To even consider that is horrifying. And so, as MacArthur continues to criticize and say, this is how we should do it, this is how we should do it, Truman, who was afraid of fighting China, oh my God, if we fight China, does that mean the Soviets are going to get involved? After all, they'll still fight. I don't want to start World War III. And he fired General MacArthur. An incredibly unpopular move. MacArthur will return literally to a hero's world, and they will parade, ticker tape parade for him as he returns. Truman, of course, thinks that this is what's going to cost him his presidency. 
He even says his famous phrase, the buck stops here. I had to do it. This is where it, it all stops with me. The buck stops here. That's when he said that famous phrase. Well, well, well known. The President of the United States. This is where it stops. Another famous quote came out of this same time. Here's also MacArthur's answer to all of this. You may have heard, old soldiers never die. They simply fade away. So a lot of famous, famous quotes come out of this time period. And that brings us to our interlude again. It's 1953. 52, 51, 54, it doesn't really matter. It's the 1950s. The Soviets have the bomb. You're the President of the United States. You ask your generals, how do we win this thing? What would you do? I mean, what are acceptable losses? How do you win a nuclear war? Are there acceptable? Well, you know, if we knock out ten of their cities and they only knock out two of ours, I guess we've won. Is that the kind of math you want to play? In a nuclear war? So the title of this story is mad. Crazy. The most insane story you could ever consider. I mean, would you ever consider a nuclear war? It was on your list of options, right? You could start a nuclear Why would you start a nuclear war? Are you insane? But how do you win one? How do you win? How do, what do we do if the Soviets do this or the Chinese do that? How do I win? asks the President of the United States. He's finally answered by Secretary of State John Foster Dulce, who calls for MAD the greatest, horrific, most powerful acronym ever to come into existence. MAD, Mutually Assured Destruction. Mutually assured destruction. I want to make sure you understand what that means. Some of you like to use analogies, you know, of uh, the two cowboys pointing the guns at each other, right? You shoot me, buddy, I'll shoot you. Oh, it's, uh, it's so much more than that. And then I would have asked you, did you want to go mad? Most students at this point have said yes. They want to go mad. They want to make sure that the Soviets know never to attack them. The only way to fight a nuclear war, ladies and gentlemen, the only way to fight and win a nuclear war is to not fight one at all. You see, that's what man's all about. To not fight one at all. To make sure that your enemy knows, is assured that if they pull that trigger, that they're dead too. In fact, at the height of the Cold War, Richard Nixon is known to have said to his advisor, Henry Kissinger, you gotta make those guys think I'm some crazy son of a bitch. That I'm just gonna pull, pull that trigger any moment. They gotta know, they gotta be afraid. I mean, how do you do that? How does that work? Need a whole new vocabulary. I learned this vocabulary not only growing up during this time period, not the 50s, I'm not that old, but a little later when things like preemptive strikes became even more of an everyday word. I even took a course, The Effects of Nuclear War was one of the books that we had to read, The Nuclear Almanac. The Fate of the Earth. This entire book really, really bothered me because one-third of the book was simply on nuclear winter and how that would destroy all life, all, all life on the planet, all the way down to the microbes. I mean, maybe something in the Marianas trying to survive. And can you imagine titles like this? Living with Nuclear Weapons. Boy, that sounds fun. Living with Nuclear Weapons. Let's have a vocabulary lesson here. 
What do all of these various words mean? Well, first of all, let's start with the basics. There is the fission, the fusion, and the neutron bomb. Fission bomb, that's what you saw at Hiroshima, at Nagasaki. Fission, splitting of the atom. Fusion bomb is what we started working on in the 1950s once the Soviets had their thrown fission bomb. A fusion bomb is the exact opposite. It's what happens in the sun. The fusing together of atoms. The fusion bomb is about 50 times as powerful as the fission bomb. So, for those who've read Hiroshima by John Hersey, you know how terrible that was. Imagine 50 of those all at once. And then the neutron bomb, ooh, that's a really cool one. The neutron bomb is straight radiation. The neutron bomb would actually kill all life and leave the buildings intact. Then there's the dirty bomb. The dirty bomb is, uh, that's something that we deal with more today. Uh, you didn't really see its use that much during the Cold War because a dirty bomb is basically just some nuclear material, some kind of explosive device like dynamite, wedge to it, you set it off, it's not going to do the same kind of thing, not even close to what a, a fission bomb could do, but it could irradiate anywhere from uh, several blocks to a quarter of a mile, square mile of a city. It, it's something that, you know, people in the CIA and the FBI are terrified of, some terrorists getting their hands on nuclear material, you know, like maybe Oh, I don't know, some of those missiles that the Soviet Union, which no longer, longer exists, doesn't have anymore. What happened to all those? <laughs> Story for another day. Nuclear winter. <laughs> Interesting that nuclear winter came up during the Cold War. This one actually does have something to do with cold. Nuclear winter is the idea that so much dust and dirt and debris would get up into the atmosphere. I'd like to remind you that um, many scientists believe that, or theorize that the dinosaurs were ex made extinct by an asteroid slamming into the earth and kicking all this dust into the atmosphere. Well, what would hundreds of nuclear bombs do? Well, what happens when a single volcano goes up? How that affects climate? Hundreds of nuclear bombs would create what was called the nuclear winter. So if we had a big enough, big enough nuclear war, they would create a nuclear winter, preventing all sunlight from coming into the Earth, and therefore pretty much killing everything. Everything. IRBM, ICBM, SLBM, what are those? Those are different kinds of BM, ballistic missiles. A ballistic missile is a missile that you launch. An IRBM is something that um, we believe that the Iranians might even be working on at this point, an intra-regional ballistic missile. A missile that can go from won't stay in the hemisphere, but hit something else in that hemisphere, like uh, launched from, oh, I don't know, Cuba and hit Washington, D.C. That would be an IRBM. An ICBM, Intercontinental Ballistic Missile, you can pretty much figure out what that is. Up into the atmosphere, outside the atmosphere, come back down somewhere else. In other words, it could go from one continent to another, literally from one side of the planet to another side of the planet. And then in SLBM, the submarine-launched ballistic missiles realize that what that means is you've just got to park your submarine, oh, I don't know, in Tampa Bay, were there ever any Soviet submarines in Tampa Bay? I would almost definitely believe there was. Park yourself right outside of uh, any particular city, nice and deep. I'll tell you in just a minute what the uh, submarine commanders were told during the Cold War. But before I can do that, you must know the very first two words, the first strike and the preemptive strike. First strike capability, that's what they always talk about, first strike capability. We must, we must, Mr. President, maintain first strike capability. What does that mean? It means that you have to be able to shoot first. Because if they kill you before you can shoot, you lost. I mean, the way to win a nuclear war was pretty straightforward. Destroy all of their missiles before they launch them. Destroy all of the missiles before they launch them. You must keep first strike capability. But what if you lose it? Or, remember, the way this war works is it's not about what you do, it's about what you think you can do. What the other guy's thinking. Does he think he can get me? 
What if you lose first strike capability? Well, then you must launch a preemptive strike. Huh? Okay. Okay, look. That guy's gonna punch you. And if you don't have your arms up, or you're not looking and he punches you and knocks you out, you're in big trouble, so what do you gotta do? You gotta hit him before he hits you. You have to launch a preemptive strike if you think they have first strike capability. If they can lock, knock out all of your missiles before you do anything, you must launch. See, what I'm trying to help you understand is how everything has changed, how this has pretty much, to be blunt, destroyed our Constitution. What do I mean by that? Right now, as we speak, the President of the United States is being followed by someone who, a man with a briefcase, handcuffed to his wrist. Inside that briefcase are nuclear codes. If President Trump is told, or believes, whatever, that a nuclear launch, a nuclear attack, is headed towards the United States of America, he has about 15 minutes, not counting SLBMs, he has about 15 minutes to retaliate before our missiles are destroyed. What does that have to do with the Constitution? He doesn't have time to consult with Congress and ask for a declaration of war. He's got 15 minutes or less to decide the fate of the entire planet because nuclear missiles are on their way. <laughs> are you sure? We'll talk about that as well in just a few minutes. So understand how all this entire game has to be played. So what do I mean by the SLBMs and the orders that they got? Okay, how do you assure destruction? Here's how you do it. You give your commander a simple, a simple command. Commander, here's what I want you to do. I want you to take a submarine, and I want you to get lost. Where should I go, sir? Anywhere you like. I don't care. Just go. Every, whenever, certainly not on any kind of a pattern, regular basis, I want you to come up to the surface. Okay? And what do you want me to do? What I want you to do is just communicate with us. You know, how you doing? Who won the World Series? Stuff like that, we'll let you know. All right, sir, I understand. What if you don't respond? Sir, Admiral, that's of course what I'm talking about here. If you don't, if we don't respond, if you hear nothing from us, if we are gone, what I want you to do is I want you to launch those missiles. I understand what this means, everybody. What this means is if the Soviets catch us napping, and they destroy every single nuclear missile in every single silo. And they're having a great, wonderful firework parade in Moscow, in Red Square, celebrating the end of the capital ascent. Whether that be a day, a week, a month later, whenever they're having this party, in the middle of that party, as they're looking up, ooh, ah, at the fireworks. And at some point, someone looks up and says, that's not a firework. And that's the last thing they ever say. As some submarine somewhere near Moscow has surfaced, realized we're all dead, launched its missiles, and the Soviet's destruction is assured. They have to know that if they press the button, they are automatically dead. Even if we're all dead, because somewhere there's a submarine. During the entire Cold War, another example. Another example. Squadron of B-52s flew up to the North Pole and circled. And that's all they did. When they ran low on flu, on fuel, and the little squadron came up and replaced them. So that again, if we got completely wiped out. They caught us with our pants down, we're napping, whatever. That that squadron of B-52s that's been circling for 10, 20, 30 years, whatever, all of a sudden realizes that the United States of America is no more, and they stop circling, head to the Soviet Union, and again their destruction is assured.
as you can tell. It's mad. It's insane. You're risking the entire, entire planet Earth. Life on Earth. Wiped out. Because you don't want to fight a nuclear war. I mean, why would you build all these weapons? Do you remember earlier? When we said that during the Cold War, the United States of America was going to destroy the planet Earth eight times? Why do you need to destroy the planet Earth eight times? What did you miss a cockroach? You need to do it eight times. Because they can stop you seven times. Because they have one other ballistic missile I did not tell you about. And that is the ABM, the anti-ballistic missile which could shoot down our ballistic missiles. So they make 100 ABMs, we've got 100 ABMs, oh, they stopped us. So let's build 100 more. Mm -hmm. They build 100 more. Mm -hmm. Oh, they keep stopping us. So if they can stop us seven times, but we can do it eight times, we win. Two famous movies came out during this time. One much, much, much more famous. Much older, Dr. Strangelove, or How I Learned to Stop Worrying and Love the Bomb, starring none other than Peter Sellers, yeah, that guy from the original Pink Panther movies. Dr. Strangelove, I, oh wow, I recommend that. It's a lot better. Now, there's nothing wrong with war games. You know, a whole movie about a computer mistake causing the end of our life on Earth. And, and these were actually realistic. They were. We established something called the DEPCON system, the Defensive Condition System. DEFCON 5, everything looks pretty good, don't have to worry about a war. DEFCON 1, nuclear war. If these computers think we're at war, if our radar shows the missiles on the way, we've got 15 minutes to decide. More than once, flocks of birds were sometimes mistaken as incoming missiles. The DEFCON system is still used today. In fact, I just looked it up today, just before I told you the story. I want to see what DEFCON we're at in. First of all, thank goodness, I can tell you right now, 2020, we're at DEFCON 5. There's a big alert at the bottom of the DEFCON banner that says we've got a national crisis going on because of coronavirus. But at least as far as our nuclear weapons go, whew, none of them are cocked and ready to go like they would be at DEFCON 2. We have been at various levels of DEF. Were we ever at DEFCON 2? Yes, obviously we've never been at DEFCON 1, but we were at DEFCON 2, which we're going to talk about later on. A whole nother way of fighting nuclear war. So this is what you would have done if you had decided way back when to go mad. Because you felt like there were no other options. How insane! Destroying all life on the planet. So in the 1950s, this was, this was the sign that you were ready, that you were someone of some kind of wealth, that you had enough money to build yourself a bomb shelter, which created a whole other issue in America. Now I know that those of you living in Florida don't know what a basement is, certainly could not imagine living underground because of our water tables, but throughout most of the United States, people all over the country started building themselves their own little bomb shelters, complete with canned food and everything else. But imagine if you were um, the first one on the block with the bomb shelter, and your next door neighbor, you know, the one who used to babysit your kids, knocks on your door. Hey, Joe, Joe, um, you, you'd let us in if the big one were coming, right? And maybe you let Joe in, but then what about the neighbor next to that, and the neighbor next to that? Tensions, every man for himself. So you can begin to understand this whole McCarthy era. It not only, not only was fear of communism, but every man for himself kind of idea. If you had a bomb shelter and so-and-so did not have a bomb shelter. And then, then you would have hit Vietnam. Now most people think that Vietnam began late 60s, early 70s. Other people think it began a little bit earlier. Well, we can actually go all the way back to 1959. Or further back if you want to when you talk about, you know, Indochina. Indochina, halfway between India 
and China. The war in Vietnam for the United States began the moment the French pulled out. It was a battle known as Dien Bien Phu. I know you can't really see this. Dien Bien Phu. It's, um, it's the Vietnamese Yorktown, if you want to understand the analogy, that the Vietnamese had finally gotten rid of the French. Hey, remember that whole story after World War II when they started letting their, their countries go, England let India go, they let um, Egypt go, and, well, sort of, and so many others go. Did the French let Indochina go? No. French had learned their lesson. After World War II, they went back to Indochina. Ho Chi Minh sees the French as an enemy, a colonial power ruling over them, fights to get rid of them, even turns to the United States, says, would you guys help me get rid of the French? And of course, the French are allies. No, we can't do that for you, Ho Chi. Sorry. And that's when he begins to turn to communism. How about you? How would you communists help us get out? And so, at that point, in 1959, I would have asked you, do you want to get involved? Do you want to start sending troops, sending aid, anything, advice or something? There's no UN to help you this time because the Chinese and the Soviets are going to veto you. Do you want to get involved? And after Korea, well, we weren't sure. Did we want to get involved? What should we do in Vietnam? A quick correction, I said 59, it's 56. The parallel, by the way, 17th parallel, 17th parallel, not 38 this time. And then I would have said to you, ah, never mind. Nobody's really paying attention. There's some country that's out of the planet. Plus, it's just military advice. But you know, it's, uh, it's time to do a diddy diddy dum diddy do. Are you tired of talking about nuclear war? I know I am. Let's talk about some fun. Let's talk about the 50s. Sha la la, shaboom, shaboom, yeah. That's next. Can't wait to listen to some music with you guys. Bye.